When I sat down with Brian Schrouder, our intent was to film a short interview that would be useful to his target audience, communications managers, and corporate affairs directors. However, what came out of that interview was pretty darn interesting. So good, in fact, that I decided to share it as my podcast. Now, as I have this conversation with Brian, we will be talking about corporate affairs managers and communications directors and other people in the public relations space. However, the lessons are just as applicable to them as they are to a small business owner just like you. If you're a corporate affairs manager or a communications manager and you're working for a relatively large organization, there's often pressure on you to get media coverage. Where's the media coverage? Why aren't we getting enough positive media coverage? Because it's your job to dial up the positive and dial down the negative. Of course, that is easier said than done, which is why today I have as my guest My good mate, Brian Trouder, I often say that, but Brian and I have known each other for maybe a decade or two now as a former mentor of mine. Brian is the founder of MediaCraft Communications. He specializes in helping organizations get positive media coverage, manage their negative media coverage. He is the best media trainer I have ever met. And just for fun, I remember this the other day, when you were like in your early 20s, you used to host like Adelaide, Adelaide, you were like the Adelaide newsman or something? I, I was I was the weekend newsreader on the ABC in Adelaide. And and I also did I also did the weather <laughs> uh, from time to time. So between shifts, I, I was occasionally the weatherman as well, too. But you were like a kid. You were like 20 or something or 21. How old were you when you were on the TV, on the news? It, it was my literally my first job out of school. I was still at uni when I started. So I, I finished my, uh, I was studying at Adelaide Uni. I finished my degree part-time while I was already working in the media. That would have just been hilarious. You're on the news doing the weather or talking about there has been a landslide in Kuala Lumpur. Right. And then the next thing you know, you're off at the pub and you're like in your early 20s. It, that's right. I used to, well, yeah, so I, I did what any normal 20 year old would do and sort of, you know, go out, hit the, uh, hit the pubs and clubs and Adelaide, it's all in one big long street. Very small. Yeah, very small. So, yeah. And so, you know, every, every part of the evening where your mates are going to be. So I've, I've finished, you know, reading the late news on a Friday night, still in kind of, you know, newsreader makeup on and I'd, so I'm looking the biz and go out and, and hit the pubs and just turn up where everybody is. And then, you know, um, the next morning. So I had quite a few shifts where the next morning I was doing the morning radio shift and I was just like, well, what the heck? I'll just stay up all night. Yeah. It's just, it's just so crazy to think the anchor man, you know, the person on the news. And then over the years, I think you did a bit of foreign correspondent stuff when you're yeah, in like Thailand that. for a bit. Yeah, yeah, all of that. Yeah, um, that's right. Exactly. And then yeah, I remember all these things. And then we met when uh, when Brian was my boss and he yeah. taught me a heck of a lot of stuff. And then uh, I went off to launch a magazine. He continued on with his corporate career mm-hmm. uh, and has become somewhat of a legend in the Australian media landscape, as I said before, particularly when it comes to media training and crisis management. But today we're talking about media coverage and how to get it. And you've got a five-step process that is often a good, simple place to start if you're a corporate affairs manager or a comms manager and the boss wants some good media coverage, where's the best place to start? Okay, so the the the, the first place to start, and, and it it's it starts with often the boss breathing down your neck um, because success uh, in the corporate world is still, even in the age of social media, is still judged very much on how much positive news media you can generate. So you've got this pressure. That's you starting off under pressure to do this. The first thing to do is stop and ask yourself and your boss, typically it's the CEO because 
she or he is driving the direction of the business. Why do you want media coverage? Not just to get your name in lights, that's great, but to make this more than a vanity project, what's the value that we attach to having our name in lights? What do we want people to know about us and think about us when they see our name in light. So, you know, what are our what are our business objectives here? As CEO, what's your business objective? Where do you want to, to take the business and, and what do you want it to be known for? And then how do we build a communications program that gets people to know about you and about us for the right reasons? So I can already see that we're elevating ourselves above the typical uh, comms manager or corporate affairs manager if you're asking these bigger questions that align this idea of media coverage, get us some media coverage, Sally, get us some media coverage, Fred. It's really different if you can attach that and align it to the commercial goals of the business. So what's an action that our people who are listening to this can take to, I don't know, make this a little bit more real? I, I think first thing is sit down with your boss, who's likely to be the CEO uh, and the corporate leadership uh, of your business and think through what are your strategic goals and objectives and, and then just think about that linkage between what we're doing as communicators uh, to, to be driving those corporate goals forward. That's, that's that. You need to so have just, that it's discussion. It's just a simple question. Why are we doing this? And I'll yeah. tell you what, I can just see immediately. That just reframes the conversation. It's not yeah. go get us media coverage. It's yeah. you're bringing it back to the powers that be and saying, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I can see immediately you're going to be taken more seriously. All right. So number one is uh, understanding why you're doing it. Interview the boss. Mm. What's number two? Number two is thinking about the media that is the journalists who play in your space. So if you work in supermarkets, who are the journalists who write about retail issues? Um, and what are they saying about you? What's being, what's being said about not just your business, but your industry in the media? So uh, you, you, like, you need to know who you're going to be pitching stories to uh, and who you're going to be, you know, fending off questions from uh, before you, you know, before you go down very far on that path, you, you, you need to know your audience. I can remember us doing this together years and years ago, two decades ago, Brian, and the, the industry was auto. And I remember doing this. I remember coming up with the list, know your media is the lesson, who are the players and what are they saying? Is there a simple action? Yeah, um, and, and, and that is to do a media audit. Yep. Uh, it, it just work through and it, it sometimes helps to uh, uh, do some, some media monitoring just to, to see um, what comes up. Uh, there may be some media players that, that you're not uh, immediately aware of, um, but uh, consume lots of media and go through forensically to work out uh, who reports regularly on you and on your industry and what are they saying about you and your industry what are the themes topics and issues which come up regularly and what are people writing about that's your so, starting point so audit sounds like a scary word but this could be the outlets the journalists what they're talking about or themes or topics and then we've got three columns and we're on our way. All right. One, why are you doing this? Two, know your media. What's number three? Is who are your media spokespeople? That's to say, if you're going to tell a story as an organisation, you need a human face for the storytelling. Yeah. So because it's more authentic, uh, it's more credible, uh, and when you're talking to a journalist, you don't just want a corporate comms person talking to a journalist. The journalist will want to talk to the business leadership. They want to talk to the expert in that particular subject matter or field of business uh, to get the real story. So who's going to be your media spokesperson? Uh, and that's not always a foregone conclusion. It's not always the CEO. Um, some topics are going to lend themselves to having 
uh, an expert or a functional business lead uh, as opposed to a CEO. So it's a matter of, of working through and determining who your spokespeople are going to be. I remember once again, a, a million moons ago when I was working at Telstra, um, there was the chief science officer mm. and his name was Ziggy Switkowski. And he was, a no, he became the CEO later. Yeah, he became the CEO, that's right. But he yeah. was originally the chief science officer. Or yeah. Maybe I'm getting the names all wrong. But I remember the science officer was so much more interesting than the CEO at the time. Maybe he became the CEO later. But what we're saying here is that you've got to identify a spokesperson, which might be the CEO or it might not. But there are also going to be domain specific experts within the organization that can lend so much more credibility to the business than just saying, this is a press release from brand name or corporate affairs yeah. manager. Uh, and, you know, there, there are going to be uh, areas of, uh, of, of any business. So if you get into, you know, we were talking about, um, uh, uh, retail uh, supermarkets, uh, and when you get into, um, you know, some media will want somebody from your organisation to come on the radio and say, "Well, what are the best buys this week?" <laughs> um, so, so you will need someone who. That's spend... different to why is the sharehold why why the shares yeah. tanking this week? Yeah, it's like <laughs> that's that's not a CEO's function to dive into the price of. Uh, the price of peanut butter or fresh fruit. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, you might have a food safety or food quality issue uh, or that comes up as a topic. Uh, and so you're going to need someone who has, because any organisation in that space has, you know, um, food safety expertise. So you're going to need a technical expert there to tell you, you know, to tell an audience as to why that peanut butter and fresh fruit are in fact safe to consume. And I can see this also being really great for your reputation if you're a corporate affairs manager or, or, um, or a comms manager within the organization because you're, um, you're empowering different players within the organization to have a voice. Yep. And everybody loves to have a voice. So you get to know all the different people from all the different divisions that have the different layers of domain yep. expertise. That sounds like a really positive thing to do for your own Career and personal enjoyment, I imagine. Uh, the, the 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 comms or corporate affairs lead has a unique role in the business because they're across so many functions, uh, and they can be the you know part of the glue that that, that, that keeps different disparate parts of the business together. Um, the uh, it, one effect very often of doing this well is that it builds. The, the appetite for media engagement in, in, inside of an organisation. Very often it's, ah. we're a bit media shy. We don't like to put our head up um, above the parapet. Um, you know, we're not that kind of a business. We'll just, we'll just, you know, the mentality can be, even if it's not articulated, is um, we'll just kind of keep our heads down and do what we do. We're not number one. We don't want to be seen to be too flashy. <laughs> As soon as you get some runs on the board in terms of positive media coverage, you build an appetite. You I love have, this. You'll have people inside the business come to you and say, hey, I saw, you know, you got, you got Fred or Jill in the Fin Review or in the, the you know, the, 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 the New York Times the other day. Um, I've got this great story and I reckon it can get, you know, some, some similar kind of media prominence. So suddenly you're off and running and you're, you're building that interest in, Hey, we can, we can do things. And you're, you're helping, you're, you're getting your organization to help you as well to find those stories that you need. So to bring this back to the original dilemma, the boss says, where's the media coverage. If you identify your spokespeople and you empower them in some way, you are, it's, it's someone says, where's the media coverage it's very easy to say, well, it's very difficult to have media coverage if we've got no one who's willing to speak to the media. Mm. If you want to get media coverage and you have five people that are all willing yeah. and able to speak to the media, that makes life so much easier. If there's an action that we can attach to this one, this particular uh, step about building the appetite, what is an action that we can take? I think that you have a an authority checklist or matrix or something yeah. that, that can help with yeah. this. It's, it's about... It's a process of, of identifying the leaders. Um, so that's not just your, your corporate C-suite, but who are the, the functional business leads in particular 
Um, they may be across particular divisions of your organization, or if you're a business that spans uh, different geographies, who are your country or regional leads? Um, so you've got, you've got um, that tranche of people, and you also have people who are deep technical experts um, uh, who can be brought in to, 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 to bear on, on technical topics. Uh, and on issues which might arise in your business as well too. So it, it's it's building that checklist, and part of that is not merely identifying all those people in the business, um, but also mapping them against the media topics that you will need them or can invite them to speak to. So what are their areas of, of competency? What are their areas of suitability? Uh, and and you can you can build out. Um, that that matrix or checklist accordingly. So I can already see that there's a method to the madness here. Uh, if you've got the why, that's almost like a situation analysis. If you've got your, uh, if you know who the media you are, that's a bit of a media audit. Within the media audit, it has topics. Then you have spokespeople, you have your leaders, your experts, and then you can align them with the topics in the um, in your in your media audit. I can almost see like a like a strategy coming together for the organization. Who'd have thunk it? What's what's number what's number four? So number four is you've got if you think through the you know where we are up to now you know we've we've got you know a direction for the business uh, we've got media targets that we've identified uh, and, and we've got spokespeople and authorities on particular subject matters and issues which are right arise in the media. Okay, great. The next thing is finding the great stories from inside your organization, the success stories, the innovations, all the, the people stories, all the amazing achievements that ought to be in the media and aren't because no one's made the connection about this stuff is happening, which people ought to hear about. So very often, and it happens so often inside of any kind of a business, that there are untapped or unmined nuggets of wonderful stories just waiting to be discovered and told. So the corporate affairs and communications role is, you know, they have that job of going digging for those great stories, effectively mining your business for wonderful, positive media stories. Mine the business for the stories. Mine, yeah, mine the stories. And I, I think that I've heard use that language before that you can do story mining. I've heard you use that language before. We go mining for stories. Let's go yeah. do some story mining. Yeah. Um, if there's an action for this, it's easier said than done. But yeah. if I wanted to go take out my my proverbial pick and shovel, what, what yeah. would I? What's an action that I could take? Uh, well, it's a bit like getting out the pick and shovel in that it, it takes time, and you may in the first round only scrape the surface. Um, you know. A couple of ways of doing it. One would be to get a whole bunch of people in a room and, and start brainstorming ideas. Not always easy to do that quickly, particularly these days. You know, you've got to set up a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting and get everybody on the same page. Not always easy. A simple way of starting the digging uh, would be to contact five people who you know have some uh, degree of, you know, serious degree of knowledge about the business. So they might be uh, divisional, functional leads in the business, or there might be somebody in the business who you know just knows a lot about the business, right? Um, and ask them, bring them up, send them an email, but ask them for three story ideas, three things which they think uh, are, are like really interesting about something to do with what's going on in their part of the business that nobody knows about, but people should. Um, and it, it could be, it could be um, a, a simple people story. Um, yeah, you know, um, somebody's done something interesting within the organisation. You know, yeah. we were having a conversation before, and I, I joked about Brian being a twenty-something-year-old newsreader. There are yeah. stories within the stories, but I guess for the action here, what you're saying here is conduct a handful of interviews mm. with functional leaders, say yeah. five functional leader interviews, yeah. ask them three, ask them one question three times, which yeah. is what's something interesting happening in yeah. the business. 
five times three is 15. Surely there's got to be some decent ideas that can come out of that. It's like, and, and sometimes it's the simple thing and it's asking the simple questions. I had, I was working with an organization uh, last, this came up last month. Um, so they were planning their, their 50th anniversary in Australia. Uh, they're a B2B business and they, they sell big things to, to, to large organizations. So 50 years in Australia. And I was thinking, well, you know, what are the various ways that you look at that? So one of them was, well, who is your first customer? <laughs> yeah, you know, 50 that years is ago, interesting. Who is your first customer? Yeah. And the answer was, oh, yeah, he's 90 years old. He lives in Perth. He's still going strong um, <laughs> and he still stays in touch and he loves us. There's a story. There's a story. Man. There's a story. All right, I'm going to recap. All right, number one is the why. What's your objective? Number two. And an, and an, an objective that aligns with the uh, with the commercial goals of the business. Number two, know your media, conduct an audit. Number three, identify the spokespeople to build the appetite. Number four, mine the stories. Do a bit of mining, interview five functional leaders. Uh, what's our fifth piece of advice here? It is making sure that you and your organisation is prepared to be able to go out and pitch your stories to the media and also be ready for the media to come knocking on your door because it's one of the things when you happen, when you get more media exposure, you become more of a media target, they'll get more interested. So there are going to be more things that might, more reasons for the media to start asking you questions as well. So you're going to have to be prepared. So being prepared needs knowing how to speak to the media effectively. So when I say effectively, it's media has a particular language. When you read a newspaper online, it's written in a certain way. Uh, and, and like, first of all, it's written with like really short words because like if you're not a technical expert in that area, you're not really going to understand much. So it's written in plain language. So you can't speak to them like a lawyer. Um, so you need to learn how to, and you, as a corporate affairs spokesperson, uh, or corporate affairs lead, you need to be able to write in media-friendly language and you need to be able to train your spokespeople to speak to journalists when they're talking to journalists in a way which connects with their audiences. It's not just corporate jargon. It's going to be authentic, but it's going to be in language that people can get, that resonates, and, and simple everyday kind of language and, and, and use of framing of, of issues and subjects that is appropriate for the audiences of the journalists who are interviewing you about all the things or the great wonderful things that you're doing and, and sometimes about the issues that can lead to negatives if you don't handle them correctly. Well, that's, that's what I'm thinking. This is a double-edged sword here mm. because at the beginning it's go out and get us some media coverage. And then you go out and you get some media coverage. Then things begin to flip and you've got to be prepared for inbound media mm. coverage requests. Mm. Now, when you get inbound, suddenly the media wants to speak to you. You've got CEOs that suddenly get a little bit timid. They say, I want media coverage and suddenly that they're shaking in their boots. Or sometimes um, it's negative and either they come, you've you've raised your attention, mm. Uh, you, you, you've lifted your head above yeah. the above the the reeds. They can see you now. Sometimes they have some difficult questions for you. You got to manage that. And sometimes they come in for a positive story, yeah. and then the person who's the spokesperson is not trained, and then suddenly the positive story becomes a negative story. A negative, yeah. And if you're the comms person, if you're the comms lead. You need to be setting up your entire team to be prepared to not only speak that you know, that that uh, that language that they're all going to be understanding, but you need to set them up to be prepared if negative things come in or help them avoid saying the dumb stuff that's going to get your business in trouble. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it, and it's very often that, that dumb stuff which generates the negative headlines because when you get into even something as simple as, as how do you price your product, um, then you can so easily get led uh, into subject areas which can get very sticky very quickly so it's how do we manage those media conversations how do we yep. how do we control uh, to the extent that we can uh the, the outcome of a media interview and by the way and, and so what what happens is is very often okay you get some you know you get a bad headline and then 
everybody goes back in the shell. You know, they're yeah. like, oh, you know, we had this really bad experience six months ago. We're never going to do another media interview. And, and that is no reason not to keep going with this process. Because when you think about Bad things can happen to any kind of a company. You can be the sad subject of a negative story tomorrow, regardless of whether or not you've got a track record in the media. Yeah. But if people, but here's the thing, if people know you for a positive reason, it's like, oh, it's that company that, that you know, coming back into supermarkets, yeah, we shop there, we know them. Um, you know, they, they, they seem to have a good image. Um, uh, they're out in the media a fair bit and, um, you know, we, we kind of trust them, you know. Um, so if something bad happens to an organisation that people know and, and, you know, have a degree of trust with, um, it's way different to something bad happens and you get media prominence uh, in an organisation where nobody knows you. The first thing they've ever heard about you is there's a crisis, there's a disaster, there's an allegation that you have done something really, really bad and you don't have a track record of positive trust building buzz, media coverage, yep. anything like that. You they need to build it because it's going to be protecting you in the future. They won't give you the benefit of the doubt. Now, exactly. now what I'm going to do is uh, I've watched Brian um, deliver media training. I've watched him sit down with clients and he is a master at identifying challenges. He is a master of turning negatives into positives. He's a master in helping people avoid accidentally turning positives into negatives, which I've seen as well too. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze your arm, Brian, and I'm going to say, um, could we put a link somewhere around this? And maybe anyone that's interested, any comms manager or corporate affairs managers, and I'm talking about only people with aspirations to become total leaders within your industry and your organization. No time waste is allowed here. If you're that type of person, I'm going to ask Brian, can you perhaps set aside a little bit of time to be able to offer, say, 25 to 45 minute risk assessment sessions for anyone that's interested? They have Absolutely. to be this type of person, right? Yep. So yep. if you're listening to this and everything that Brian has said has made sense and you'd like to have a conversation about this five-step process, maybe you want to apply it to your business and maybe you could throw down five challenges within the organization and just get Brian's input because there is no one quite on the planet quite like him. Now we need to we need to wind up right now, but I'm going to say any final words of advice, Brian, before we uh before we wind this up. Uh, it, it's you've got to do it. Um, uh, it, it, it. We're in a world uh, where uh, people want to know and want to trust the organisations, the companies that they are buying products from. Uh, it's no longer just enough to be good at your job uh, or sell good stuff, but they want to know more about you and they want to know the story about the organisations that they are buying products from and the, the values that you stand for and, and all the other stuff as well too. So that's the world that you need to engage with uh, and you're not going to build a business uh, and you're not going to build a career for yourself um, as a corporate communications professional, if you allow your organization to sit under a rock, you need to be out there and you need to engage and your organization uh, needs to engage as well. So I'm going to stay, so stop being a seat warmer, take action, take all the advice that Brian's shared today. Uh, find the link to download that uh, Crate Authority uh, checklist or even book a call with Brian. Brian, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Been fun for me too, James. Thank you so much.